and this is our final panel, panel three, Digital Blackness in the Archive, Collecting for the Culture. Um, be moderated by Kimberly Springer, and I will allow her to take over from here. Enjoy. Thank you. Yeah, there I am. And we wanted to first thank everyone for organizing this amazing conference and also the panelists who came before us. They have set the bar very high. I think we're all feeling like we have so many amazing ideas swirling around our brains. So we're going to try to keep it cohesive. Um, I wanted to just start by saying that the initial question that we were given or how we've interpreted it is how should we collect for the culture? And I think it's it's important just to note this construction in terms of the idea of, you know, the culture. Is this a capital T? Is this a lowercase t? Is this a, a capital C for black culture? Because I think that tells us something about or helps us question where and with whom agency lies. And so also that's tied to accountability. And so how are we accountable as researchers, as archivists, as preservationists, as technologists? So I think what we wanted to do today was to suggest some, some methodology and how we're thinking about all of the things that we've heard over the last couple of days in terms of, of who decides and what does radical inclusion look like. So what we're going to, how we've structured it is um, instead of like formal introductions, we'll each introduce ourselves and talk about something that we are working on that we're excited about. And then also discuss this in terms of some keywords so that maybe we have some takeaways and intentionality about what it is that we're doing here. And we'd also like for you to think about what are your keywords when it comes to this notion of collecting the culture. So up first. Tanya is up first. I will pass the remote and you have your mic. Okay. Hi, good afternoon. There we go, that's better. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tanya Sutherland and I am an assistant professor of archives and digital culture at the University of Alabama. Um, my work, my, my most recent work, has uh, focused on dead black bodies in digital spaces and has uh, compared those records, those, those digital records, to lynching records, trying to draw some comparisons and, and come to some understandings about what has changed and what has not changed over time. So, um, you know, it's both historical work, it's visual culture work, it's digital culture work, it's archival work, um, or archival studies work, anyway. Um, and I have uh, kind of moved through um, thoughts about embodiment and thoughts about, um, about agency and uh, thoughts about amnesty, the, the amnesty that archives provide in not collecting around, around the culture, around black culture. Um, you know, I, I have argued previously that um, in, in pardoning the offenses of white slaveholders in the South with Proclamation 189 that Andrew Johnson basically um, enacted an, an, an amnesty and that archives continue that amnesty in a refusal to or an unwillingness to or even just in not thinking about collecting records that would allow or uh, allow for or make transitional justice possible, restorative and transitional justice possible for African Americans. Um, more recently, I've started thinking about data and the silences that exist, not only in data that we collect, but also in who gets represented at, at tables where decisions are made, um, you know, who is writing algorithms. It's not as though these things write themselves, right? Um, it's also not as though uh, they exist in, in, in vacuums. So we are people, we are building systems, we bring with us to the table all of, the, all of our own personal biases. Those biases get embedded in those systems, including archival systems, um, including, you know, our, our digital systems, our social media, all of that. So um, I've taken that one step further to start thinking about risk and needs assessments, uh, which are tools, instruments that are being used by the criminal justice system or the prison industrial complex 
to uh, think uh, to make to make recommendations about bail, to make recommendations about um, uh, parole, um, you know, length of incarceration. These are these are tools that are being used to su suggest the likelihood of recidivism or the likelihood of someone to reoffend. They are based around a series of questions and then also on public records. And so, um, part of what I want to say is that. is that I've been thinking kind of against the grain and against Archivy. In watching Who's Streets last night and in thinking about Archivy in general, um, it's, it has really occurred to me how our records are used against us as a community and how there are tactical things in place, right? So you can, you can see that the police have tactics. You can see that bringing in the National Guard is a tactic, that using the photographs that we take during, during uprisings um, and then having those photographs be used against the people who were out there in, this, in those streets trying to affect change, that um, you know, those are all tactics that are being used against us as a community. And looking to other communities, there are levels of, of access that are provided to their records. They are, there are levels of access that are provided to their culture. Um, some things are just for them, and some things are open. So, you know, radical inclusion, yes. But I also think we need to be thinking about radical exclusion. Whose records, whose culture, who has a right to, um, to those records? And we really have to think strategically and tactically about how those things are being used. So I kind of want to leave you with um, some thoughts about critical resistance. And mostly what I want to say is that that critical resistance needs to be collaboratively developed. We need to be working together as a community to collaboratively develop some forms of critical resistance. And that might mean that some people don't get to be a part of the conversation. And that has to be OK. That's a discomfort that we might just have to sit with and that they might just have to sit with. So um, I'll leave it there for now and uh, pass it off for someone else to introduce themselves. But those are kinds of the things that I've been thinking about lately. OK, so. Um, I wanted to introduce my work in that I'm excited about. I'm excited about all of the work because I just started my job uh, two months ago as curator of oral history at Columbia University. And what I am trying to do as I enter this job is try to bring together a few strands of, of current and past research. So I wrote an examination of black feminist organizations from the 1970s called Living for the Revolution from 1968 to 1980. And based on that, I had the COINTELPRO records from one organization, the Third World Women's Alliance. And it was striking to me how the best archivist of that radical socialist organization was the, the FBI. And they came from the COINTELPRO. They did notes. They did summaries. <laughs> it's great. So I want to go back to those records to look both at the newsletters and how they were surveilling the group in ways, of course, that the group wasn't aware of. Um, but I'm also, as curator of oral history, trying to think about how is, oral, how is social media oral history, or is it? I think that's the big question for me, um, particularly with you know how we've heard um, through other panels about the importance of the real world communication and how that translates both online and offline. So I'm working around some of those questions and was thinking about the, the fire hose of information as we've constructed how we think about social media and the feed. And I tend to work better when I have some sort of, of theoretical anchor to work from. And I was thinking about um, Toni Morrison in particular and her approach to um, defining a black aesthetic. 
And for, I'll read the quote for the people who might be uh, viewing over the live stream. It starts, if my work is to faithfully reflect the aesthetic tradition of Afro-American culture, it must make conscious use of the characteristics of its art forms and translate them into print. And Tiffany, which is call and response, which we discussed yesterday, the group nature of art, its functionality, its improvisational nature, its relationship to audience performance, the critical voice which upholds tradition and communal values, which also provides occasion for an individual to transcend or defy group norms. So there's a lot there, and I'm gonna try to unpack a few of these, just a few of these things in the time we have, because I think it's useful to think about social media in this respect as as being a part of a black cultural tradition, so capital B and also a capital C, and how we might then um, counter, well Morrison talks about the ways in which black literature was sometimes dismissed as lore or as gossip or as magic or sentiment, and I think we scholars have done the work of trying to recuperate um, the notion of black Twitter, for example, and to say this is a distinctive form that African Americans are taking on. So I wanted to then consider the idea of having a black digital aesthetic. Very popular quote. <laughs> because um, I think it, you know, she's, she's capturing this, this notion that we don't even need to explain what this aesthetic is when it comes to black. But we might need to explain it when it comes to what that digital nature looks like. So we talked about call and response, and I've been thinking about the, just the engagement that we have across social media and how we might then come to ask particular cultural questions about retweets and about likes and about quote tweets. And as you mentioned earlier, you know, screenshotting something because you don't want to give somebody the retweet. Um, also, the uh, nature of, of group conversation and also functionality. And in particular, we've talked about hashtags and how those are used. And I'm also thinking about um, Twitter's new, the new word length of 280 characters, but also very interesting to me is how people are using the, the lengthening of your Twitter handle. Some people are putting entire sentences there. Some people are just you know, putting key phrases there, but they're signaling a kind of, of blackness or a kind of cultural difference in that space. And also, I won't go through all of these, but just to make a note of the, the communal values that Morrison talks about. And that returns us to this question of, is this a big or little C in culture? And also how the values are changing and evolving in this space. So what do we do with that in thinking about a black digital aesthetic? And this is way too small to see, but I just wanted to, um, Note, uh, this was, I used the web recorder IO tool, which I'm not sure if people are familiar with it. It might have come up as we've been talking over the last couple of days, but it was developed by Rhizome, which is based in the New Museum in New York. And you can put in the URL for a social media feed and it will record the feed. And it does, it gives us some of that experience of how people are experiencing, say, GIFs or videos also within that, which I think is very useful. But I also think it's um, useful in thinking about a black digital aesthetic with, I just did some experimenting with hashtags to try to capture how people are talking about things that we might have talked about in African-American history or African-American literature, say for example, around respectability politics and how people are talking about that on Twitter. Um, also the notion of black identity extremism, which is you know the, the FBI's latest attempt at reviving COINTELPRO, I don't think it ever died, but. Um, and noting that I think it's useful to note misspellings when we're using these tools and accept that as, as part of the stuff that we're gathering because people misspell things. Um, and, and they might misspell them intentionally or accidentally, but still we want that to be captured within what it is that we're doing. So I thought this tool, um, I, I went down a rabbit hole with this. <laughs> this is only part of the things I was looking at. But in determining this um, black digital aesthetic, I also wanted to make the point 
that I think we can use this particularly as archivists and preservationists to expand beyond, for example, social movements, to think about a kind of wholeness of, of black culture. I did some experimenting around, for example, TV, um, TV hashtags, because I like my television, um, and the ways that African-Americans will signal to one another and discuss television amongst themselves with particular hashtags that are counter to what the networks want you to use. So for example, The Walking Dead, I think is like usually hashtag The Walking Dead or The Walking Dead AMC. But black people, day walking, <laughs> them deads. And it's part of you know the, the joy of discovery too when you like a television show and you're like, okay, how are black people gonna talk about this? And you start experimenting with the hashtags to try to figure that out. So I just wanna advocate for just a really sort of, you know, there are the ethical questions, but theoretically a uh, kind of wide sweeping of what we mean with a black digital aesthetic and what we're gathering and what we're archiving. So I'll leave that there. Alrighty. Um, so I, um, in thinking about this talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it is that I've been collecting for the last several years, and then what it is that I'm really excited about <laughs> that I've started doing. And um, I think I tweeted out yesterday that Marissa, for the second December in a row, has inspired me to think about uh, particular ways that we engage with Twitter around signifying. So last year at Purdue, she said that bots don't signify. And I went, but why don't bots signify? A bot could signify. And I think she had another, uh, another statement where she said, essentially, that when bots learn to signify, right, like black folks, then we might have something to worry about. Ooh. And then she moved on to talk about something else. I don't remember what your next thought was. I just remember those two things were of profound significance to my entire universe. Um, and have remained so for the last year. So thank you. Um, but I really started thinking about the way that um, that we understand language and culture, right? So all of my degrees are in communication. I've always been really interested in how we learn culture, we learn language, we learn to communicate with people, to use language and communication as part of the way that we sort of just live our lives, right? Like I'm fascinated by the people who say, you have a PhD in communication, so you learn to talk? I'm like, you know what? What you're not going to do? <laughs> you're not going to discount all these student loans. That's what you're not going to do. <laughs> so, I'm like, uh, it's a little bit more than that. How many times have you seen people be completely unsuccessful at the process of communicating to like their kid? <laughs> like, it's hard, right? But also, I started thinking about all the ways that we kind of talk with, we talk through, we talk past people, right? And then how that happens on social media. Like one of my favorite things, um, and I know this is probably just a little bit petty, but one of my favorite things to see on social media is especially sort of in that collective of black Twitter, right? Is when, um, when you see in the press that somebody gets something wrong, right? Um, so I think it was six months ago where a newspaper used an apostrophe after the word yo, and people were like, that doesn't even make grammatical sense. <laughs> you think about why an apostrophe is used in English, <laughs> like, hmm, right? And so I, I started thinking more about sort of this idea of signifying and how, how signifying works as a, as a construction. Right. Uh, and the thing that I started thinking about around what Marissa was saying about how bots don't signify is the fact that a bot can't signify because a bot doesn't live. Right. And signifying is something you learn to do through lived experience. Right. That it is the embodiment of of race, of class, of culture, of history that makes signifying possible. Right. It is something that you can learn to do 
if you live in particular kinds of cultural spaces and particular kinds of cultural ways, but it is not necessarily something everyone can learn to do, right? This is not in everybody's culture thing, right? Uh, and so the project that I'm really excited about is, which way do I go on this one? That one. The project that I'm really excited about is for the last, I guess, five years, I've been using um, tags to collect various hashtags. So remember that magical March day in 2015 when Starbucks decided that they were going to do this race together thing and baristas were going to start having conversations about critical race theory? Wow, you got your coffee in the morning. Do you, any of you remember this moment? I do. Because <laughs> I was on Twitter in the morning <laughs> at the Starbucks. And I saw this and I went, no, ma'am. <laughs> and I'm from California, so when I use ma'am, I am take that with all the belittling it's intended with. <laughs> and I was like, mmm, mmm, I have whole degrees. And I can't have this conversation with people before coffee. Right. Like, did I don't I don't understand all the baristas go get PhDs in the night? Like, I don't understand what happened. Apparently I wasn't the only person who had this response. <laughs> and so I started thinking about so there was the race together hashtag, which I did collect, and this other hashtag, new Starbucks drinks, which I also collected. And so for the last several months, I've really been excited about looking at these kinds of hashtags that start with sort of a particular kind of cultural and specifically corporate intent, right? So Starbucks started this race together hashtag with a very particular corporate intent to be able to have a dialogue around race and culture that, that the CEO feels like isn't happening, right? But then he... I guess forgot audiences exist, I don't know. Um, and there's this whole other hashtag that comes up in response, new Starbucks drinks, right? As a corrective to signify, right, on this idea of whether or not we can have these sorts of conversations and what kinds of um, both professional training is necessary, but also critical cultural buy-in is necessary for this to happen, right? And I love it because especially in new Starbucks drinks, you get this whole moment where you learn what signifying really is. Um, and one of the things that you really learn in this moment is that you have to have a whole cultural calculus in order to make this work, right? And that cultural calculus is 100% lived and embodied and it comes out through your work choices, right? So this is my new exciting, um, I think I send a Tanya half-baked process, half-baked idea that I can't wait to make a full-baked idea. So that I'm gonna stop there, but say that this is, this is the project. Hello everyone. I'm Adrienne Russell. I think I'm the only non-doctor up yet, so I'm glad to be here with everyone. <laughs> no, actually, I love I love being in, in spaces with doctors. It's, I, I consider myself an honorary academic because I I glean so much from you all when I'm up here, and it just makes me like beam with pride when I sit with with black doctors. Yes. I know. I just love it. I just love it. I've been so, so proud and happy these past two days to just be in this space with everyone. So I just want to take a moment to just kind of sit in that and acknowledge that because I've just been like gushing about it all day. Just like, this is so great. I'm glad I'm here. So please bear with me as I kind of bask in that for a second. I'm so sorry. <laughs> This doesn't happen a lot. It doesn't happen a lot in the Midwest. I'm from Kansas City, so it just doesn't happen a lot here. So I'm excited to to, to just have this moment and to have it happen, um, especially in St. Louis. And it's just really exciting. So thank you for having me. So I'm glad to go. So um, like I said, my name is Adrian Russell. Um, I am a co-founder of the Digital Humanities Project, Museums Respond to Ferguson, um, which started 
very soon after um, the death of Michael Brown, um, a, a few museum bloggers uh, got together and uh, made a letter asking museums, well, what do you guys plan to do in response when things like this happen in our community, when, um, when citizens find themselves uh, victims of state violence, when things happen right outside your door, um, when your staff is suffering, wh what are we gonna do? This has happened too many times and we're just sick of not doing anything. Um, and, and so we, we made an open letter and we put it out there and uh, the response was pretty much the crickets, <laughs> which we expected. Um, but then after that, um, we decided that we wanted the conversation to continue. And so I said, well, who wants to do a series of Twitter chats with me? Who wants to keep this conversation going? And luckily, um, Aaliyah Brown said, I'll do that. And uh, my co-conspirator decided to, to continue those chats with me on Twitter. And so for the next three years, um, we had uh, nearly monthly chats on Twitter interrogating anti-blackness um, in museums and learned a lot um, <laughs> about what museums will and will not do when it comes to discussing race uh, internally and externally um, with their staff, with their publics. Um, we learned very quickly that uh, many museums have instructed their staffs not to discuss these issues specifically. Um, that's what uh, some very brave staff told us. Um, some actually told us that they could not talk to us about that. Um, and that was not too terribly surprising. I worked in museums a long time um, and learned very quickly um, that while museums do take stands on multiple things all day long, um, when it comes to issues of race and ethnicity, um, they like to consider themselves neutral. <laughs> Well, we know that that is really not neutrality. Um, they don't want to, for many reasons, offend visitors, donors, um, staff, board. Um, but in doing so, they're offending visitors, donors, staff, and board. <laughs> Just not the white ones. <coughs> so, um, and those conversations we, uh, which we um, have, um, Storified, and I'll get to the link to show you that. Um, we noticed that a lot of the, the people who are participating in those conversations um, were mostly white, and so that's actually um, indicative of the field itself. Uh, most of the people who work in museums are white. They're mostly um, cis hat, they're mostly women, um, and that is a problem. Um, the, the pipelines that feed into the field um, traditionally come from um, schools that have those populations. It's a very expensive field to train yourself for, um, and, and it's a problem of over-credentialing, I feel, um, as museums strive to try to make themselves more <laughs> credible in a way. They're mirroring lots of other fields um, that want you to have master's degrees, they want you to have PhDs for, for jobs that particularly don't necessarily require them, and so you take on a lot of debt, you take on a lot of um, loans, and so you find yourself in this predicament of having you know forty or fifty thousand dollars worth of debt in your back um, to have a position that pays you maybe ten or thirteen twelve dollars an hour um, and you have to also acquire a certain number of, of internships that don't pay you um, in order to get these positions so very few people from a varying economic backgrounds can take on those kinds of, of um, jobs and then get into positions where they can work in museums um, I came to it as a complete humbug I was in AmeriCorps and working for about three dollars an hour, um, and was getting a nonprofit leadership degree st undergrad. And then, when they said, "Okay, you need to have a job," I was like, "Well, there's a part-time or an undergrad, a part-time admin position," and I applied for it. And my sister was working at a museum at the time. She's like, "Oh yeah, go ahead and apply for that." And I was like, "Well, I like museums. I, I like art. I'll go apply for that." And I mean, you would have thought I was trying to go work at like Fort Knox. I did like seven interviews and. <laughs> it was ridiculous. <laughs> and I pretty much just like, I think just kind of charmed and schmoozed my way into that place, I would be quite honest with you. Um, 
And at the time, I thought this is, shouldn't have been this complicated. Um, but I was glad I was there. But I literally fought and scrapped my way into that place. Um, but to get to the major point, <laughs> um, one of the things is the, that kind of sustained me through that whole process um, was this quote here. Because this is literally how I felt. Did I get it? Excellent. Um, this is how I felt. This is what I thought that whole process was there was no seat for me there. So I brought the chair. And this is how I feel about, um, <laughs> about how we have to approach any space that we come into, whether it's a physical space, which is a digital space for black people. Um, as I've progressed in my thinking, since the time I've started working in museums, I really don't even want to bring a chair. I kind of want to set the entire table on fire or take an ax to it <laughs> and then burn what's left. <laughs> but uh, if you can't get that, if you're not that radical yet, bring the chair <laughs> and make a space for yourself. This is kind of what we were trying to do with Museums of Rhonda Ferguson. This is what we do. We say, look, if you can't take over completely, find a space, bring your chair and just start a conversation somewhere. So this is what I'm excited about with the work that we do with that, the work that I do with consulting with museums, is trying to find a place where you can start a conversation and try to change the internal culture of your museum so that people feel safe inside, and then you can make people feel safe outside. But if your internal culture is messed up, your external culture is going to be messed up. There's nothing you can do outside your museum that is going to be safe and not cause harm if your internal culture is messed up. So harm reduction is what I'm all about. Okay. So as I'm thinking about um, some of the things that get me really excited, my keyword is kind of dismantling. I'm, I, as I mentioned, you know, destruction of the table and, and burning things to the ground. I mean, that's really something that has kind of become my, my mantra. You know, Audre Lorde talks about, you know, you can't dismantle the you know, master's house with the master's tools. And that's internal, that's internal work. As I'm talking about museums working internally, I'm also talking about um, working internally. When, when Kayla talked yesterday about how she had to work on her own biases, that's me as well in the last three years. I mean, working on, you know, how I've had to learn about, you know, my own personal biases, learning about, you know, the, the things that I held internally. I mean, I didn't know anything about, you know, gender binaries, trans I, I mean, it was the, the things I did not know were shocking. And those were all things that I had internalized and did not realize the biases that I held even intracommunally. And so uh, those are things we have to dismantle ourselves as we're moving forward, even as we work within our own digital practices. So making sure that we're not leaving those communities out as we're moving forward, um, even in our collecting practices. Because the narratives that we're excluding as we collect and as we curate is really important. So every time I look at people's collections, when I do collection studies in museums, I'm like, whose story are we not telling? Um, who are we leaving out? I look around the room, I'm like, okay, somebody's missing, I know it. It's just, it's just a given. I'm just gonna say, every time I sit down at the table, okay, who's not here? And then how can we correct that next time? Can we just stop and go find them? You know, does this process have to move forward? No? Okay, well, let's go get them, and then let's come back to the table. Um, because there's no reason why it can't stop. You know, it doesn't have to continue. Um, so some of the things I try to, to encourage people to do is to look at um, Afrofuturism as a curatorial practice, kind of, you know, approaching it as, you know, imagining a different future for yourself as you collect. Um, this is something that I really do think that, uh, and I know they hate this name, but the Blacksonian. That's my <laughs> That's what I think they're doing. I mean, that's that's really how I feel. I, I feel that that's what what that that curatorial practice is. It's really kind of centering that story and that narrative. It's so present and so focused, um, and it's just it's just that's it. We start there. It's everything's at the center and fans out from there. And I think that's just lovely. Um, and they also have a nice focus on the ephemeral things, collecting uh, black Twitter, collecting things um, from Instagram, collecting memes. I mean, these are this, this ephemeral stuff that no one's really thinking about how to preserve and how um, to make 
uh, focused. So that's one of those things. And then just literally creating new spaces, saying, okay, we're going to focus on making a home for this stuff, not trying to shoehorn it into something else, but giving it its own uh, specific space. Um, and then expanding the canon. Um, when you talked talked about making um, new spaces for new literary um, futures, when you talked about, you know, why is there a black stormtrooper? Well, duh. <laughs> why shouldn't there be? Um, you know, expanding what you think of when you think of the canon. Th that those should be parts of the future. So, in terms of the the art historical canon, you know, why aren't we looking at things beyond that? Um, and then just access over everything. I want people to understand that all this stuff means absolutely nothing if we don't have access to it. They're just things getting dusty on a shelf or on a wall if we are not allowed to have access to them. So those are the things that excite me. Um, and these are just some of the projects that I have mentioned earlier and where you can find some of the things that I'm working on. Museum of Fonda Ferguson, we have a storify of some of the chats that we've had. Um, Muse Black is just a, a digital hub that we have on Twitter. It's a group you can um, at me there if you want to get invited to that group. Um, and Museums of Sites for Social Action is a collaborative project that I'm working on with um, the Minneapolis Museum of Arts. Um, if you're affiliated with the museum and want to participate in that, you can find out more. There's a toolkit there um, that anyone can download for free um, with some action steps to uh, use in your organization. So thanks so much. So I'm struck by, I think, a commonality amongst what we're talking about is the notion of, of gatekeepers and challenges to ideas about, about neutrality. Um, so I'm wondering if, um, if anybody could address either how you negotiate your, your own role as a gatekeeper or um, how you go about challenging other gatekeepers in doing your work. Um, the question was about gatekeepers and challenges to neutrality and how you go about either um, negotiating your own role as a gatekeeper or challenging and dismantling others' roles as gatekeepers. Um, there we go. Um, I really like that question. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I try to think through uh, as, especially when I'm teaching this stuff, right? Cause I, I teach a research methods class that's a sophomore level class, right? Uh, and so when I teach about collecting hashtags and especially I appreciate the earlier conversation around the ethics of doing these things, right? One of the things that I do teach my students about is this idea of being a cultural gatekeeper and how access to language gives us access as a gatekeeper, right? Uh, that there is uh, a sort of an investment in that right um and then making one of the things i try to think about is there are lots of things that i will collect but there are not lots of things i will write about right um and i recognize that in creating some of these collections that are especially using tags which yes is an open source you know option it's also locked away behind my google address right and so if I'm not providing um, access to that through whatever, through Hydrator or some other kind of tool, right, then that's, I'm, I am functioning as a gatekeeper in collecting that but not sharing it, right? And if there are things that I'm collecting that I'm not sharing that I'm then intentionally not sharing, not writing about, um, what happens to those things? So one of the things that I've, I've been thinking about for a while is if I have a particular intentionality about why I'm not writing about something, you know, 50 years from now when my papers are archived at my university where I went to undergrad because that's my intention, are they gonna replicate my gatekeeping intent, right? Mm -hmm. Even if I write it down and say, don't make these available, at some point, right? 
Like, I think this is something that happens that we see in all of us who do some kind of archival work, right? Um, that we see this in the letters, right? Um, I was thinking about this and recently the digitized papers of Anna Julia Cooper were released, mm -hmm. right? And I'm sure that when she gave those papers over to, to Howard, she wasn't thinking to herself, you know, I should probably put an embargo on my bills so that <laughs> they're not shared, right? Now, whoever made those choices digitized them and put them out in the universe, right? And so when we think about gatekeeping, I also think about the ways that we sort of keep things for ourselves as an individual way to survive every day, but we also institute, how are those choices institutionalized or not institutionalized? You know, <clears throat> archivists have a bad reputation for being gatekeepers um, <clears throat> and and are often thought of as uh, gatekeepers to history, right? Because so many archival collections really are historical collections. Um, and you will find among many professional archival conversations, conversations about neutrality. And there are a, a, there are a whole group of practicing archivists that believe that archives can and should be neutral places, and you will find tremendous pushback against that notion um, that, in fact, not only are archives not neutral spaces, they, they never, ever should be. They are sites of power and of privilege, and um, they are sites of memory, and that all of those things have bearing on the day-to-day the -day lives of, of actual, real human beings. <clears throat> The archivist as gatekeeper is, it, it's, a, it's a mode that I think archivists do slip into, and some of that has to do with the professional training that archivists get. You know, you're sort of taught as a student of archives that uh, there are these policies, these are, these are the procedures, these are the best practices, and um, you know, you are the person who is ultimately responsible for the care of these materials, and that you are therefore ultimately responsible for history. It's a huge responsibility, and not one that um, I think enough archivists, if I'm being frank, take seriously. Um, so when I teach, I, I tell my students that it's, their job to think about provisions of access. And it's their job to think about power. And it's their job to think about, you know, the policies that they write and whether, you know, being closed on weekends means that you are, in effect, keeping people out of an archival space because, and you know, as an archivist, you may not get to write that policy, right? It may be above your head, but you can advocate for different policies and different kinds of procedures that would allow for an opening of a space that does often feel closed to people. So I'm talking about physical archival spaces right now. In terms of the digital, um, that gatekeeping happens behind paywalls. It happens, um, it happens with passwords, right? And not all of it is inappropriate, but what it does need to be is intentional. And that's the problem that I see right now. It is not an intentional practice. Not everything that I create or you create is meant to be public. Um, and we, I mean, we know that, we're, we're people like, right? We don't put everything out there. We, we very carefully curate the selves that we put on, on digital display. That being said, there are things that I would share with other members of my community because I know my experience or um, this thing that happened to me might benefit them, might, might benefit my, my broader community. There are questions, three questions that I ask my students to consider. And you know, uh, in, in varying ways, I ask them to respond. Usually I ask them to respond visually and not verbally. Who are, your, who are you is the first question. Who are you? Who are your people? And given your responses to, to those two questions, what are your responsibilities? And they struggle. 
I struggle. I ask myself these questions every single day. And answering them is, is never an easy task. So when I say that I don't think that all records belong to all people, that, that a gatekeeper role might be appropriate and that it needs to be intentional, I think, for example, of the um, Plateau People's Web Portal. Right. This is probably a project with which many people in this room are, fam are familiar. And one of the, the beautiful things about the Plateau People's Web Portal, it, it's, a, uh, it's a database um, for uh, the Plateau Peoples, uh, uh, the tribes. And it was worked on by a woman named Kimberly Kristen and a, a host of other people. Um, but depending on who you are in the, this, in these tribal communities, you have different levels of access to the data in that database. So if you are an elder, you might have different access than somebody else. If you are, if you are a member of that community, you will have different levels of access to what is there than someone who is external to that community. And it, I just, I think that in terms of intentionality, those are the kinds of things we need to be thinking about and talking about um, in, in, in our own digital spaces. What does it mean? What would it mean? What would it look like for black people to be really intentional about what we collect and who we allow to see it, how we, how we allow it to be used? Um, because as I said in my, in my sort of opening comments, you can, you can bet, you can bet your very last dollar that it can and will be used against you. Connected to that, because you mentioned in your talk, um, in your comments, that we need to help people people speak critically and strategically, or you said strategically and tactically. And I like that configuration. So I'm wondering for your work and actually for, for all of our work, how do we go about doing that in real life, in real communities, particularly when it comes to translating some of the, the jargon and the ways that we have learned to speak about these things in order to sort of, you know, establish a place of power within them. Are you asking how do we help communities advocate for themselves? Within? How, do you take the things that, how do you take the things that you are working on digitally into the real life space? You know, I, I really don't know if I'm comfortable so much with the idea of telling communities how to advocate for themselves. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I basically just tell people, like, if, if you're uncomfortable with something that someone who claims to serve you is doing, then just tell them in whatever way you feel you want to say it and just say it over and over again until they can't ignore you. Um, because it's, I'm really not in the position to tell you how to advocate for yourself. You know what I mean? Now, if, if, if there's specific language that I can offer you that kind of perks up their ears, I will do that. Because I, I, I do know certain words that will make them pay attention. I'm, I, I will definitely do that. Because the, especially with museums and, and cultural organizations, there are specific terminologies that you can give them buzzwords that'll make them go, oh, you know. <laughs> you might know what you're talking about, you know? And that's, that's just kind of like code switching and, 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 and if, I'm, I'm happy to provide those words for you, um, but it's sometimes it's really not necessary. Um, I think sometimes just the novelty of a person speaking to them that they normally don't hear from is enough to make them pay attention. Um, and in a lot of cases, when I have had people ask, you know, say, oh, well, we want to go speak to this museum about the way that they're treating us, that's enough to just put enough fear in them that makes them pay attention. It's really quite unfortunate. Um, they're so not used to hearing from their non-white audiences that they will usually do one of two things. They will either just outright ignore you, which means then you turn to like the media and it forces them to hear you, or they go, oh my God, we're so used to not hearing from you, we've got to pay attention. Um, so then they listen to you. <laughs> so I mean, I, I don't, I, all I can, all I usually say is, um, okay, if you want them to pay attention to you, here's some things you can do. Um, give specific examples of the ways you were treated. Um, if there's a survey, fill out the survey, you know? And so, because those are things, those are tools that they offer you, use the tools they offer you um, to complain, blah, blah, blah. Um, but a lot of times um, I'm not, I don't feel comfortable trying to say, here's how you should express 
your displeasure. You know what I mean? I, I feel like that's me taking some kind of like paternalistic role or whatever. Um, and I may be overthinking it, but it just feels like I'm like trying to tell them how to do something, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to play that role. Any other thoughts on that? Because I was thinking in particular about. Um, I've of course, obsessed with privacy and surveillance and the ways that um, I'm not seeing them, perhaps they're happening, but conversations with marginalized communities about privacy when it comes to the internet, because I think we tend to think about, um, in terms of digital culture and data, oh, they want the data of the people who can spend money. But capitalism knows everybody can spend money at some point, even if they have very little of it. So I've been trying to figure out how do we, I guess maybe broaden the conversation to include marginalized communities along those lines. And so with your work about the, the records that are being kept on people, like how do we go about teaching people about what those, those records mean? Because they already know, because they experience it daily, but I think the work that you're doing gets deeper into that. Are there any questions from the audience or keywords that you've been thinking of? And you can also sort of wrap in the, the last two days of, of learnings that we've had, if there are things you want to speak on. Do we need the, are we microphoning the? For you, actually, Kimberly. Um, but again, thank you guys. You guys are brilliant. Um, I just had a question because you were talking about <clears throat> thinking about social media as oral history, and I found that really intriguing. Um, and I was wondering, as part of your study, have you looked at the use of threads and what that means to your work? Because I know at the museum we use that a lot to think about counter narratives um, to mainstream history and culture. So I was just wondering what you yeah. thought about that. Yeah, I've been think looking at threads in terms of the both the functionality of the platform, but also the ways that people create them. So, and it comes down to even, you know, things like how do we have accepted cultural norms when it comes to that? And I think it would then, the oral history part of that in real life would be asking people, how did you perceive this thread? Uh, what gave it credibility for you in terms of, you know, are you using the the reply feature to make it look a certain way and to look like a cohesive idea? Put that in air quotes. Um, so yeah, so I'm really interested in making sure that I foreground the features as much as I do what people are saying because oral history is both about the content and the methodology. Thank you. Um, thanks, everybody. I just wanted to, because somebody here just posted about Storyfy ending in March or next year. And I was just thinking of in reflection to your hashtag. So I just wanted to to ask you what you're, because I was literally talking to Erin yesterday about, hey, let's Storyfy everything from, and then <laughs> today it's just like, oh, it's over. Yeah, one of the things I was going to make sure I talked to Aaliyah with the, before we left was the fact that, you know, our archival platform is dying. Um, and we've had many conversations about that, where's the best place to put it. And every time we thought of a place, it was like, oh, that's dying. Um, so, yeah, and that's part of the nature of this, this whole thing is that, you know, platforms don't live forever. Um, so uh, um, I don't know where our next life is going to be. It's probably a, yeah, right, so far as the thing that's only managed to survive in, my, in all these years that I've been working digitally is blogs. This is the thing, right? The thing that every time you turn around and everybody says they're dead is the only thing that's managed to survive the last 20 years, right, <laughs> are blogs. I'm not even kidding. I mean, the, of all the things that I've ever done that has managed to have the longest shelf life is a blog that I started almost 10 years ago that people still call Cabinet of Curiosities. People still reference it. I haven't written on it in probably two years but it still gets brought up all the time and it still has a life. I still get comments on it <laughs> and I haven't touched it in probably two and a half years. And that's probably the only thing that's managed to survive in this digital era with some, some kind of consistency. So, I mean, I'm probably, I'm leaning towards that. I'm not gonna speak for Aaliyah, but 
Um, we could probably slap all that on a blog and not touch it for the next 10 years and it would probably be perfectly fine. Um, but with the way these platforms are, with the way Storify is going, um, and I'm thinking in my head right now about what's happening to things like Patreon and stuff like that, um, the whims of these developers, I just can't. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I just don't trust it. So yeah, that, that's kind of how I feel about that. Yeah, We're probably better off going with something with some stability and just zhuzh it up every year and just not worry about it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Adrian's right. We're going to like transfer everything to a blog, but also I have paper copies in my apartment in asset free folders for you archivists. So, um, <laughs> this is why I partnered with the public historian. So this is why. Uh, so yeah, that's our, um, nascent game plan right now. <laughs> Come talk to me about archive it uh, and the internet archive. Um, but also, I mean, web recorder was mentioned. Like there, there are options out there if you want to kind of do the work of preservation and keep a local copy even to your to yourself. But yeah, it's you know, it's no one's full time job here to do that on top of everything else. So uh, if we can help um, from our end with uh, web crawling, that's that's why I'm here. Any other questions or comments? Did any of you have questions for other panelists? Or? I have a question. Um, and actually, I've, it's for you. Um, so when you think about doing, because I, I also think about Twitter often as an oral history, but also as a personal archive. When people tweet out about things and like pictures of their kids or that Christmas dish that was suspicious, right? <laughs> <laughs> or delicious. <laughs> you know, when you think about, especially the sort of people's timeline as sort of an oral history, how do you have like a particular thing that you're looking for or characteristics like how, what helps you understand it as an oral history versus like just you know daily musings i guess i mean i think i'm thinking about the the timeline and social media as as part of the oral history so how can we add it to actual interviews as components so for example um Right now, I'm trying to construct a project around space broadly defined, because I don't want to scare Columbia, because they're the biggest gentrifier on the Upper West Side. So I want to talk about space in terms of gentrification, and I've mentioned this to other people, like talking about street vendors and public spaces and how there are housing developments that say they're going to have public space, but then cordon them off. And so right now, I'm in the mode of collecting tweets and things related to those things and trying to be strategic about the geography of it since it's going to be New York focused. Um, but then thinking about that as just one part of, of the utterance of oral history because the, I mean, there's the Oral History Association and it has its guidelines and criteria for doing oral history. So I want to be true to that while also thinking about the, the ethics of using the social media in that respect. So it's not, you know, the sum total but I think it's really um, important that we consider it because so much thinking is happening there. Is there a button with the microphone? There's one back there. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I, I really like the, uh, the the thread around uh, um, gatekeeping. Um, earlier and um, uh, as, as an archivist myself, um, one area that I struggle with, especially when, um, when we deal with digital collections is that we deal with platforms and uh, the main access point would be efficient metadata. But as you know, metadata is a way of gatekeeping. Uh, and I wonder if uh, you have thoughts around uh, you know, making uh, 
you know, metadata infrastructures that are key to, you know, access, uh, be more um, decolonizing in many ways and uh, a way to truly provide, um, you know, robust and meaningful access, but at the same time, respective of, uh, you know, cultural sensitive uh, materials and, you know, the people's privacy. Mm, metadata. <laughs> sorry. No, 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 no. Don't be sorry at all. You know, if, for me, metadata is very much gatekeeping. It's also a descriptive practice that is often um, troubling troubling, troublesome, um, you know, the, the, the languages that we develop to, to describe and talk about, about people and talk about things and talk about people's experiences. Um, <laughs> so I was, I was, I, I did a postdoc and the, <laughs> the, the whole goal of this project and I, I chuckle. I, I hope that you will you will you will see why I'm chuckling in a moment. The whole goal of this project was to take 400 years of of, of historical data, and to um, put it into a system that would somehow very intelligently normalize all of this different data. So I'm talking like census data, um, health data, uh, you know, like railway data. Um, uh, any kind of, uh, all of it, all of, all 400 years, all, all of the world's history, all of the world's historical data, put it into, put it, right, just put it into, put it into, into a system, and, um, that system would, uh, um, in a black box, a miracle would occur. And then on the other side, you would be able to interrogate this, this world historical data. Right. It's a, I mean, it's it's a beautiful idea in, in theory. Making it happen in practice turned out to be really challenging. And the big solution around this was metadata. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to provide cell level metadata. And once we have described things at the cell level, all of this, all of this data, we will then be able to say, oh, you know, did did rail did the railroad contribute to the spread of the flu in X year in X country? So I think that metadata is so critically and vitally important, Ricky. And um, I also think that it's not the end all be all, right? It can't solve all of our problems. And as much as I would like to see richer, more robust, more culturally responsive and responsible metadata. Um, I'm not, other than, other than provisions of access and the, the gatekeeping that you're talking about, um, and having people, dis having people and things described in a way that, that that reflects how they want to be talked about, how they want to be described. I'm not sure what else metadata can offer us in these particular situations. I am wide open if other people have thoughts and ideas about this. Um, but I, I, I worry sometimes that we fall into a trap of thinking that metadata will save us. Are there any other questions, comments? Um, I just wanted to like amplify this idea of Afrofuturism as a curatorial practice again. Um, Rashida Phillips did a keto uh, speech at DLF this year that was really awesome. And I walked, I don't think this was her intention at all, but I walked away from that thinking, man, I'm going to start using Afrofuturism as a curatorial practice. If we archive the future, then maybe we'll get to the future that we want, you know? And um, I'm really excited to see someone else talking about that. And I was just wondering if there's like a community of people trying to work towards a sort of uh, practice of, of that or... Um, if it was just like an idea that you threw out there. There are lots of people that I know that, that curate, and I, I think that they do that. Um, and I don't know if they've, you know, intentionally made that their practice, but they do it. And I just kind of feel like 
I'm just identifying them as such. If they do, <laughs> I'm just like, I see that you're doing this, and so I'm going to draw you in, you know. Um, and and I, I think I come from it from like kind of a, I'm like a huge reader and a writer, and so I kind of tend to identify these things from a, like a literary standpoint. So if you feel that that's something that you want to kind of pursue as a curatorial practice, I encourage you to start reading. Afrofuturism um, and just kind of absorb as much of that as you can um, from a literary standpoint um, and, and, and just kind of soak in those goals and ideas first um, and then try to let those inform your curatorial practice. Um, but um, I would love to like assemble a community. Um, so if you know anyone, <laughs> you know, feel free to send them my way because I think that would be quite a cool squad to, to <laughs> assemble. Um, and just start, you know, making that a, an actual thing, um, because I, I I really would love to have that, you know, there become a thing. I, I would say, who is? Yeah. Um, so I don't know if anybody can. Can you guys hear me? If I just talk louder, <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a couple of people who are. Rashida Phillips That's is. Yeah, she's doing it. Um, Detrice Gaskin is also doing it. Um, follow her on Twitter. Her, her, also her Afrofuturism, um, black speculative art is stinking amazing. Um, but she also has an entire sort of, um, on her blog, she actually talks about making intentional choices around digital archive and, uh, creating, uh, black art in the digital, um, and what that means and what it means to, curate and collect that work. Uh, there's also um, Ronaldo Anderson, who's actually right up the road at Harris Stowe, right here in town. Uh, he's doing uh, work on uh, Afrofuturism and specifically looking at the way that uh, Afrofuturism and the Black Speculative organize communal structures, the way that it can be used as a response to questions of the archive. Uh, and he has a book out called Afrofuturism 2.0. Um, and we'll have another book out, I think, this year. Uh, also, uh, that's called, Af I think it's going to be called Black Speculative Art. Um, the manifesto. Yeah, it's the manifesto, but and and in the manifesto, he talks about Afrofuturism as a curatorial um, theory and what it means to organize around a black future mm -hmm. um, and understand what that is. Uh, I think John Jennings also has work uh, on yeah, and Stacy Robinson. Um, Tim Fields, also, um, oh, I could totally see her face and I can't, Maya, what's Maya's last name? Um, she's in Detroit, um, and she, she also has some work, uh, mostly in fiction, but also in comics and film, um, around, uh, sort of this idea of creating, um, black futurist work that looks at uh, sort of the practical existence of black bodies in future spaces. And so there are some folks that are kind of doing this. Um, there's a conference that happens, I think it kind of travels around uh, called Planet Deep South, mm -hmm. where you will actually find a lot of the folks doing this work as sort of a squad that kick it together. Wow. Um, one that I'm happy to be a part of. Um, and I, it's gonna be in February in San Antonio, um, Kenitra Brooks. I know is one of the, I think is one of the organizers for that. Um, so there are definitely folks who are kind of doing that work and thinking about that and organizing around particular kinds of ideas. Um, and so those, those, are, those are all the folks I can shout out off the top of my head. <laughs> Um, yeah. so, um, and I actually have, I'll have a piece in Ronaldo's next book, but I know there are lots of other folks who are doing work around that area. Um, so, and in my piece, I kind of talk about digital humanities as a practical application of Afrofuturism, right? And doing digital work. So, so as a field, what does that look like? Right. If we imagine not just imagine ourselves in that space, but we are practically present. Right. 
Um, so yeah, those are, like I said, those are the folks I can think of off the top of my head and the events off the top of my head. <laughs> so yes. when I tell you that they, when I tell you that they skip over us in this part of town, I tell you the truth. <laughs> this is what I'm telling you. Thank you so much for that. no other questions since we've gone from the past into the future. <laughs> I think we can wrap up and thank everyone for your comments and your attention. Thank you.